Okay, I guess we can get going. So welcome to mathematical statistics. I don't know if you saw my, that's the look. Okay, so um, this is my all time favorite course to teach. And if you've had classes with me before, you are probably thinking that I'm lying. I've said that before, but I haven't said those exact words. So it is true that I can be enthusiastic about some of my courses, except for operations research, never, never enthusiasm for operations research. But I'm, I'm careful with my words, and this truly is my all time favorite course to teach and to do. So uh, what is it? Mathematical statistics is probability. So not really statistics, uh, certainly no data. It's a really theoretical course, and it is the probability you need in order to do statistics. So if you've ever taken a STAT 101 course or you know the equivalent and you've done a t-test or something, where did that come from? And what kind of assumptions were behind that test? And if your data doesn't follow those, those assumptions, can you make up your own test? So that's what we're gonna do in this course. We're gonna make up our own rules and give them to other peons in STAT 101 to perform tests and build confidence intervals and do stuff. And even that is gonna be a little bit hard to see. It's gonna look a lot like a probability course for a while until we actually start talking specifically about things like confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. So uh, we're gonna start off with estimation of parameters. And I'll say a little bit more about what that is, but uh, first I just wanted to clarify the probability and statistics thing. So probability, is about the future that's i don't i don't know what you're seeing here if that's a, a good direction for time for you or if i'm mirrored but um you know i am going to flip this coin 10 times and i want to know the probability i will see these are future words see this or that and then statistics starts in the future and says i have these coin flips heads heads tails 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 heads heads tails whatever and I want to figure things out about the coin. Like, was it fair? Um, were the flips independent? So statistics is like reverse engineering probability. And I've oversimplified it because probability is not reverse engineering statistics. Um, you can study probability and never stats, but not the other way around. So math stat is mostly probability. And um, it's pretty theoretical. There's gonna be proofs and theorems and stuff. And um, let me take you to the Canvas page. Where did my, oh no. Okay, our Damien, I can see you. I can't see many people. Thumbs up if you see the Canvas page. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know if you saw my announcement that there was a big problem with the page. So I'm, I'm, I think I've fixed all the broken links but I'll keep checking and certainly let me know. So the biggest thing, when you, when you look at the page, there's the typical start here, syllabus stuff and so on. But these two buttons are the most important parts of the course, I think. So this one is course notes and this is what we're gonna use for a textbook. It is not opening, it is, my textbook that has been forever in progress that's now at about 258 pages and i don't know if i were you maybe i would download it rather than having i wouldn't print it or anything but i would download it rather than having to log into canvas for it but that's up to you the other really important thing is this distributions button if we were in a physical class i would hand out a two-sided table with lots of distributions on them. Um, so this is going to be really, really important and kind of a lifeline sort of thing. And I don't know how you work best, but I really think it would be helpful to have that one printed out um, and laminated. <laughs> Look, I have another one on a plastic sleeve. Uh, you're going to be using it all the time. So 
those are the two most important things on here. Um, if you go to start here, it's just kind of standard, like read the syllabus, um, a, a goofy video, uh, see you resources, standard stuff. I didn't even write that. And if you go to syllabus, you'll see um, some important information. Um, so these are my office hours. They have their own Zoom number, which is given here in the syllabus. And I can find time to meet you guys outside of these office hours if need be, but these are the ones I'm setting up for now. Okay, so the text is my notes. Um, I do give an optional additional text, which I'm never going to reference. So if you get it, don't say, you never used that. You know, it's just if you really want something else, this is a good book. It's uh, Statistical Inference by Casella and Berger. And I give an Amazon link there, but by all means, try to find your own bootleg copy. But again, we're not using it. <laughs> Homework 30%, two midterms at 25% each, and a final at 20%. So the midterms are going to be at night on Thursdays. Um, so check your schedules and let me know as early on as you can, if you can't make this. The idea is to give you a full two and a half hours to do what is written to be a 50 minute to one hour exam. I just want you to have as much time as you need. Sometimes when I do this, people leave at 25 minutes. So it doesn't mean it's gonna take two and a half hours. And then you'll get the next Friday, the next day off since you gave me that extra time. So. Check out those dates and check out your calendar and let me know if you can't make them. The final I did not set, that's set by the university. Uh, if you're in applied math and you're taking one of our prelim exams, uh, the probability and statistics one specifically, uh, this is one of the, the uh, preparatory courses for that. And I will be sprinkling in old prelim problems this semester. So yay for that. This course, 5530, is a spin-off of a course that is called 5520, which is also mathematical statistics. This one is a little more in-depth, and 5520 is cross-listed as a 4,000, 5,000 level course, which holds it back a bit. So I created this course. We couldn't separate those two because they're cross-listed with math and other departments. And the course notes that I've written up are really my notes for 5520. I'm going to fix them up this semester, uh, probably way before we get to those parts. But um, the table of contents in the notes is a good topic syllabus. We're gonna go through everything in there. And then these are some additional topics that I will hand out supplementary material when we hit them. So this is, so the course is distinguished from 5520 by going faster, a little bit deeper, a little bit more proof and theorem, and some extra topics. Okay, then there's a paper copy of the syllabus, which is has similar information. It's not a carbon copy of this, but it is a paper copy. And I think that's all you need to know. So homeworks are going to be uh, Wednesdays to Wednesdays. Um, so assigned on Wednesdays, do the following Wednesday. Um, this is a grad course and I'm not gonna, you know, treat you like babies. I'm not gonna hold you to strict, hopefully you'll get it in on time. And if things get out of control, then I might have to enforce a uh, no late homework policy, but let's see how it goes because it'd be for your own good because you'd get behind. So let's try <laughs> to, okay. So your first homework is supposed to come out this Wednesday, but it's already posted and it's due next Wednesday, and there's a submission link to upload it to Zoom, and um, hopefully a PDF, either um, handwritten, scanned, or typed up. But if you need to, we can do JPEGs and stuff too. Um, and so I just said things about the due date, but officially the due time is midnight on the due date. The first homework is going to be unlike all of the others in that I'm not gonna cover everything in there. So normally I don't assign things that I haven't bothered to cover, but it's sort of a prereq review. And I'm going to do a little of that today, but only highlights. 
um, because I think a lot of people would be bored. A lot of people have the right prereqs, so I don't want to spend the first three classes doing uh, prereq stuff. So the prereqs in, are in the course notes. Um, there's a chapter zero, zero because it's like before the course begins. And I would like you to catch up on sections one through seven of chapter zero. Uh, so we'll do some of that today and you don't have to read all of that before the next class, but maybe try to get through that this week. And let me know if you have any questions, any other stuff I should go back and review. Otherwise, I'm just gonna do some, some things today that I think are highlights. Okay, you know what, before I do that, let me tell you a little bit more about the first things we're gonna do in this class. So I said it was estimation, and we are going to have, share a screen. So I bought this really fancy switcher, so I thought that I could share my screen um, really quickly, but it only switches between cameras quickly and um, not screen sharing, so that didn't work out. Welcome. So I've got for you the first, oh no, oh no way, okay. The first anonymous poll for this course. So, what do you think? Is this okay? Or would you prefer a whiteboard? Ooh, fine with, oh yeah. <laughs> All right, it seems that it's okay with everyone. <laughs> Certainly we have a majority by now. And let me know if you have any sort of color blindness or anything that I should be worried about. So, you maybe have heard of the normal distribution. If not, you'll hear of it here. But the normal distribution is a bell curve that's supposed to look nice and symmetric that's centered at some mean that's usually called mu and has a certain amount of spread, which we'll talk about later. And if you had a population out there with some kind of normal distribution. So maybe, I can never come up with an original idea. I always go to heights of students at CU. It's not gonna be normal. It's gonna be bimodal. There's probably gonna be you know, a peak for, for male heights and female heights, but let's suppose it, it did look like this and you wanted to know this parameter that was unknown to you. You might take a sample, right? And so the sample, heights, if we're doing heights, um, are gonna be some random variables, x1, x2, through xn. And these are gonna be the heights of people that you go out and measure, but you haven't done it yet. So there's still random variables. Because once, once you've done it and you have numbers, there's no more probability around. You've either gotten close to this or you haven't gotten close to this. But my point is, what would you do with these sample heights? In order to estimate this mu, you would most likely look at the sample mean, which is denoted by X bar, which is the average of these heights. And this is what I call a common sense estimator or natural estimator. You're trying to um, estimate the mean of a distribution and you've got a sample, why not look at the average or mean of that sample? But can you do better? You can certainly do worse. What this course is gonna talk about is a lot of different ways to estimate mu and how to evaluate which one is good, which one is better, and which one is best. And that goes back to what I said at the beginning about giving it to the STAT 101 people. We're gonna make the rules and tell them how to, how to conduct tests and, and estimate things because things do not always have normal distributions. In fact, well, I won't say rarely, but not nearly as much as STAT 101 would have you believe. So I actually got a little bit ahead of myself <laughs> because I wanted to quickly review uh, random variables. So in the, in the beginning of sections zero through seven, there is some 
really basic probability that I'm not going to go over, and that's like dice and coins and counting, like n choose k. So take a look, and if need be, I'll go over it. But I'm going to start not <laughs> great, great start. I'm going to start with random variables, which already assume that you know a little probability. So uh, a random variable is denoted by always a capital letter, and usually like x, y, and z, or whatever. And these are capital, and they'll be distinguished from my lowercase symbols because because I'll try to make them smaller, but I'll also make them like kind of curly. But I'll try to make it clear at all points in time, um, whether it's capital or lowercase. OK, so random variables are actually functions. They are mappings from the set of outcomes of an experiment involving probability to the real numbers. So let me write that down. A random variable, x, is a map or function from a set of outcomes of an experiment with randomness to the real numbers. OK, so as a first example, I'll work on my handwriting, although I've been working on it for a long time and it's not getting better. Um, as a first example, uh, let's, let's write down an experiment. So I'm going to flip a coin. And it's going to be possibly unfair, so not 50-50. And I'm going to let um, little p be the probability that we get heads on any one flip. And so there is uh, an experiment involving randomness. And now I'm going to define a random variable. So x, I'm going to let this be 1 if we get heads, and 0 if we get tails. And so there's your mapping, right? We went from these outcomes of this experiment to numbers. And if you take a more advanced course in probability, like the other one I'm teaching this semester, which is measure theoretic probability, then you get really deep into this. And it's not just any function, but they have these great properties. But that's all we're going to need here. So this particular random variable is so special that it gets a name. So note that the probability that x is 1 is going to be this number p that I've set up in the beginning. And this is a parameter for this distribution. And the probability that x equals 0 is 1 minus p. And of course, p needs to be between 0 and 1. And this random variable is so special, it gets a name. And I'm sure you've heard of this. We say that it is a Bernoulli random variable. So x has a Bernoulli distribution. So what do I mean by distribution? If you were sort of graphing like a histogram to say that I'm going to get a 1 with like this probability and 0 with this probability, that's sort of describing how the outcomes are distributed over this set 0 and 1. So a Bernoulli, a Bernoulli distribution with parameter p. And we write x, a squiggly line, which can be read has the distribution uh, Bernoulli, or sometimes just burn uh, p, to mean we're talking about this distribution. So. This random variable has a probability mass function or probability density function. If you've taken a lot of probability, you might have had it drilled into your head that you should always have probability mass functions for discrete random variables and probability density functions for continuous random variables. 
I don't make the distinction. I use the term probability density function for both, but you can use probability mass function with the caveat that it means something different, whether you're talking about a discrete or continuous distribution. So this is abbreviated PDF. You also might use PMF for probability mass function, again, for discrete random variables. PMF is the right one and PDF is for continuous, but I'm just gonna use PDF and uh, it will mean different things depending on whether we have a discrete uh, random variable or a continuous one. So if X is discrete, as it is in this example, it only takes on values zero and one, then the probability density function is, so we're gonna denote these like everyone does with an F uh, of X and in the discrete case, this represents the probability that x equals x. And so for our Bernoulli random variable, this is going to be p or one minus p when x is one and x is zero. And actually I have to say a little bit more, zero otherwise. So when I flip that coin and report the one and zero, I will never get 2.8. <laughs> okay. so. Um, if there are multiple random variables laying around, then you might take this notation and kick it up a notch and call it f sub x of x because that x argument inside is really an argument that needs to be able to change. So you do want to be able to talk about the probability that x is y. And this would be fx of y, but it would also just be f of y, assuming we know that's the PDF for x. In more advanced, um, you know, like if you read journal articles and stuff or take, I don't know, if you're sort of in the research level for probability, people will use an f of x and an f of y to mean PDFs for two different random variables, X and Y. You know, literally they're the same function with different things plugged in, so that's not right, but it's certainly the norm. But uh, since we're kind of starting out, if we have two random variables, I will make sure to subscript them. Okay, so on to our first example of a continuous distribution. And I don't think I made this board forever. So let's see how many slides I have here. <laughs> so let's talk about, this is a little scattered, uh, again, because it is the nature of me trying to do things out of sections zero through seven. Um, so, but let's talk about uh, continuous random variables. How do you like that? I've already started with the abbreviations. Um, so RV is random variables. So in this case, the PDF is a function under which area represents probability. Let me back this up a little bit, probability, and give you an example of a continuous random variable. So maybe I'm recording uh, the height of you know randomly selected students on campus and assuming I've got infinite accuracy and I'm not stuck with inches or tenths of inches then I can talk about the probability that someone's height is between 60 inches and 70 inches and I can talk about the probability someone's height is between 60 inches and 62 inches but if I randomly select a person and I want to figure out the probability their height is between 60 inches and 60.00000000013, that probability is really, really small. And it's, vanish it's vanishing to zero. So for any continuous random variable, x, the probability that x equals x is always zero. And therefore, we shouldn't define that to be the PDF, which is what we did before, because that would be really uninteresting. So the PDF now is a function under which area represents probability. So if you have like a PDF for a random variable X, 
and you want to figure out the probability that x is between two numbers a and b, you would want this area, which would be computed as an integral. And the, the fact that I included um, like a less than or equal to here and here is unimportant because those lines have no area. So this is also the probability that A is strictly less than X is less than or equal to B or both strict or the other one strict, it doesn't matter. And you can see that the probability that X equals some A is just the area of that line. It's the integral from A to A of something. And that will also be zero. So, as our first example of a continuous distribution, uh, you very well may have seen this one before, I want to talk about the exponential distribution, which is big in Markov processes. So if you take the Markov chains class, you're going to spend a lot of time using the exponential distribution. So here is an example of a continuous random variable. So rather than set up an experiment, like I'm going to flip a coin, I'm going to start with just giving you a PDF. So suppose x is a random variable, that looks like a v or something, um, a, let me be more specific, is a continuous random variable with the following PDF. So it's going to be f of x, and it's going to have a parameter just like the p parameter in the Bernoulli, and that parameter is going to be a lambda. I'm going to write lambda e to the minus lambda x whenever x is greater than zero and zero otherwise. And then where you put equality really doesn't matter because we're talking about area under a curve. So this is the PDF of something called an exponential distribution. And it arises kind of naturally, but I didn't want to take the time here to talk about an experiment. Um, but you would see in Markov processes that if you're waiting for events to happen, so my example I always use is you're sitting outside of a bank, you're sitting in the bushes, you're being super creepy, and you're watching people come in all day. If you make some basic assumptions about what's going on in terms of independence of times and constant rates of times of arrivals, which is actually not a good assumption for the bank, people might be coming in more during their lunch hour. But if you make a, uh, an assumption about a constant arrival rate and that the number of arrivals in one interval of time is independent of the number of arrivals in another interval of time, you can show that the time between arrivals has this distribution. So it's a super important distribution for us as well, not just for Markov people, but it's more motivated from a Markov processes class. So um, we say that X has an exponential distribution with rate lambda. So we write, so what do we write? I'm gonna write something a little bit different than everyone else writes. Um, so first I'm gonna write something and then I'm gonna cross it out, so maybe you don't wanna write it down. So you put your X with a squiggly line, has the distribution, EXP, and then most people put a lambda in here. This is not what I'm gonna write, so again, you might wanna hold off on writing that. Lambda, by the way, is a parameter which needs to be greater than zero because a PDF needs to be non-negative and needs to integrate to one in order to make sense. Although I did waste a semester of my life trying to make uh, PDFs that take on negative values fly and mean something, it didn't work. Um, so they're non-negative. So lambda has to be greater than zero. And certainly if lambda was zero, this would never integrate to one. Okay, so this is the common notation, but some people write down the PDF, like an alt notation here, with the lambda in a different role. And they put one over lambdas everywhere I put a lambda. And I would say that it's maybe 60-40 people who parameterize it the first way versus the second way. 
In the first PDF I wrote down, the circled distribution here, um, this is known as a rate parameter. And if you go back to my example of people arriving at the bank, it's the, um, the rate of arrivals of people to the bank. For us, it's gonna be a little more abstract, so don't worry about the bank. It's just a PDF and it's just a parameter. And we're going to see soon that uh, we're gonna review expected values of distributions or means, which are kind of centers of mass. And we're gonna see that if you parameterize the PDF the way I have the circled one parameterized, the mean or expected time between arrivals is gonna be one over lambda. And some people want to parameterize it in terms of the mean. So I am going to not write this because it could be confusing. I am gonna write specifically, x has the distribution squiggly line exponential with rate lambda means that x has the PDF, and I'm really thinking I should cut and paste this, but it might take longer, so uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and write it. Uh, lambda e to the minus lambda x, for x greater than or equal to zero and zero otherwise. And I will almost never use the other one in this course, but we will write x um, exponential with mean lambda if it has the other PDF. Okay, does that, you know, you can interrupt at any time. I can't see everyone. I can only see like four people right now because it's minimized. Um, but interrupt at any time, unmute. Um, there is a raise your hand function, but I might miss it because I'm basically showing you my scalp through this entire lecture. Um, so unmute, say something, make some noise. So if I hear nothing, I assume everyone's okay. Okay. So here is something that may be new to you, and it's actually, we're not, I'm not done with the review, but this is actually the topic of section 0 0.8 in the notes, which is not one of the ones I said that you had to know. And that is the idea of indicator notation. This is going to be super, super important for this course. So first I'm gonna define uh, an indicator function. So I'm going to use a capital, uh, no, sorry, I need to define something else first. Sorry about that. So I'm going to let uh, A be a set, say a subset of the reals, and I'm going to define an indicator function. And this is for more than just convenience. This is really going to be important. I'm going to call it I sub A, and it's going to be a function. So I'm going to put of X. And it's gonna take the value one whenever x is in A and zero if x is not in A. And other common notations for this, uh, you might use um, like, a, like a double one. Some people use this notation. I just find the I easier to write quickly in lectures and typing. Um, some people use a chi sort of thing. Some people use something called an Iverson bracket, which is a square bracket kind of thing. Um, I, I wrote this stuff down in the notes, but I'm gonna use this notation. You're welcome to use your own. Um, I will know what you mean, but if you're just learning indicators for the first time, you might as well pick up my notation. And so what is the point? The point is we want to rewrite our PDFs with indicators because, so all of our PDFs so far have been N0 otherwise. And that's not hard right, to write down at all. And I think we are going to be, you know, um, I think you're all smart enough to understand um, that I would mean zero otherwise if I didn't write it down. You know, why can't we just agree? If you define the PDF, it's zero otherwise. Why use the indicators? If I try to explain right now, I will go off on a tangent. So this week, I will convince you that, you that the indicators are important. Right now, I'd like you to get used to writing with them. So let's look at the two examples we've done so far. If we have x 
exponential with rate lambda. Um, then the PDF is f of x equals lambda e to the minus lambda x, and then an indicator. And so I want my x to be between 0 and infinity. You could include 0, but people usually don't bother you know, integrating, and that point really doesn't matter. So you put the interval 0 to infinity down here, and then an x in here. So that indicator is going to turn on and be 1 whenever x is in there which will leave you with the uh, rest of the PDF, oops, and it will be zero when it's not in there. So th there's a use of indicator notation. Again, I really have a reason that's more than just convenience for um, bringing this up. And then let's look at the other one that we've done so far. So if X has a Bernoulli distribution with parameter P, then the PDF or PMF, if you call it a PMF, you know, that's fine. But I'm going to stop saying both eventually. So this is f of x. It is the probability that x equals x for this discrete thing. And we want to write it as a function, not as a broken up thing, like it, not piecewise. So it's p to the x, 1 minus p to the 1 minus x. So note that if you plug in 1, you just get um, the p. And if you plug in 0, you get the 1 minus p. And then I want to put an indicator on that. Let me know if I'm going off the end. Uh, I think I'm still good, but um, this is a discrete set. So brackets, brackets, brackets. Discrete set, not an interval. 0 and 1. <laughs> this is looking pretty lame. So now, if you look at the table of distributions, um, there's a discrete side and a continuous side. There's a whole bunch of distributions on the discrete side and the continuous side that we're going to be using. And I think it's the very first column of each side is the name of the distribution. And the second column are the PDFs. And they all have these indicators in there. So now you'll know how to read that if you look at the table. OK, so I'm going to get through this lecture without talking about the UMVU. Did I just mute myself? Am I muted? Oh, I've got this like button sitting in my lap and I keep hitting it. <laughs> okay, so um, the next thing I wanted to review is the idea of a CDF or cumulative distribution function. Do this really quick. So if you have a random variable x, uh, be it discrete or continuous, the CDF is usually denoted by a capital F, maybe a sub x if need be, if it's not clear, if you have multiple random variables, then it gets an argument, little x or z or y. And this is the probability that x is less than or equal to x. And that is true in the discrete and continuous cases. But to compute that probability is different in the discrete and continuous cases. Actually, this is kind of important. So if x is uh, Bernoulli with parameter p, this is discrete. Um, and we know that the probability that x is 0 is 1 minus p. Oops. And the probability that x is 1 is p. And so the probability that x is less than or equal to 0 0.5 for this discrete case is just the probability that x is 0 is just 1 minus p. So I'm going to blow through this a little quickly. If you imagine accumulating probability and trying to draw a CDF, then the, oh yeah, I'll make a y-axis. So the CDF is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then when it hits 0, it jumps up to a height of 1 minus p. And I'll talk about why I didn't include that endpoint and why I included the other one. And then it's going to stay there. And when it hits 1, it's going to jump up to 1. Or in other words, the jump height is p. So for a discrete random variable, the CDF looks like a step function. For reasons that we will get into later, uh, CDFs are always right continuous. And I just don't want to talk about that today. But you'll notice that I filled in the circles, the points on the right, and left holes on the left. OK, for continuous random variables, and I'll make this really brief 
So if x is exponential with rate lambda, then um, the CDF is going to be the integral from, I'm going to write minus infinity, it's not wrong, uh, to x of the PDF, and now I need another letter because I've used the x. It's never wrong to write this. Check this out. Um, let, me, let me just actually not try to squeeze this in this little box. What? I copied and pasted the wrong thing. See, it just takes me longer because I screw up. Okay, so um, if x has, what was I trying to say? Oh yeah, so if x has uh, the exponential distribution with rate lambda, then the CDF, again, is the probability that x is less than or equal to x. This is the integral from minus infinity up to x of the PDF. Kind of bad form to put an x inside as well, but if you do it, you do it. And then if I write this in, minus infinity to x of uh, lambda e to the minus lambda u, the indicator from zero to infinity of u du, then that's gonna help me partition up this integral. I know this looks silly at this point. This is not the case I wanna make for indicators, but this is going to be the integral from minus infinity to zero of zero, plus the integral from zero to x of lambda e to the minus lambda u times one, which of course you wouldn't write. So what you expect, Right, you're gonna not start from minus infinity, you're gonna start from zero. But now we're doing it indicator style. Okay, so something else I'm gonna skip is if the uh, CDF, I keep saying I'm gonna skip things and then talking about them, but this one I am gonna skip. So in the continuous case, the CDF is an integral of the PDF, and you can get the PDF back from a CDF by taking a derivative. It's the fundamental theorem of calculus. In the um, discrete case, it's a little more ad hoc. I'm not going to give you a rule, but if you if you have a step function like this, you can you can subtract the CDF here and here and find out all of those jump heights and probabilities. It's all in sections zero through seven. Check it out if you haven't seen this stuff. Okay, so I think the last thing I can do today is. Um, oh, well, actually, one thing I do want to clear up is if you're ever asked to find the distribution of something, this means find the PDF. It could also mean find the name of the distribution. And so what you'll see on homeworks and exams is it'll say find the distribution, and then it will say name it if it's possible. So not all PDFs have nice names, but we have all of these guys on the table, these exponential Bernoulli and everything else that's there. And so find the distribution might be, I am working some, I doing some calculations and I have resulted with an exponential distribution. So find the distribution and name it means give that name. But if it's not nameable, then it just means give the PDF. Okay, so the last thing I can fit in in this review is, the idea of expected value, also expectation, also the mean of a distribution. So our notation is if we have a random variable x or a distribution associated with this random variable, we're gonna write um, this capital E of x I'm really into all my life, all my adult life, using um, square brackets here. You can use parentheses. In some texts, they won't use anything. They'll just write E of X, and it won't look so weird because they will have written the E with a different kind of font. I don't really like that, but. Okay, so um, I guess the only thing I can say, I'm not even gonna bother to write it. So the only thing I can say is that, um, Expectation is a probability weighted average. And I'll tell you what that is next time. And we'll review about half the class on Wednesday, and then we'll get into it and we'll be starting chapter one.
So thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I will get this video uploaded as soon as I can. You might have seen my announcement that it, there could be some delay, but it will definitely be today. So I will see you next time.